Hello and welcome to the latest video by LitGrid, exploring the conventions of the Gothic villain in literature. I'll be discussing iconic Gothic characters such as Frankenstein's monster, Count Dracula, and Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. I hope you find my video useful, and if you do, please share, like, and subscribe, and feel free to leave a comment down below. It was one of Lord Byron's many lovers, Lady Caroline Lamb, who coined the now famous phrase, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. This apparently unflattering assessment of Byron conveys not only Lady Caroline's disgruntlement at being thrown over, but also a certain fascination with his bad boy behaviour that fans of Gothic literature will be familiar with. His devilishly handsome looks aside, Lord Byron is best known for being one of the leading lights of a literary movement known as Romanticism that flourished in Western Europe in the early 19th century. Not to be confused with a modern term, Romantic literature, particularly poetry, includes features such as an admiration of nature, a rejection of convention, and an emphasis on emotional and artistic expression. Some early Romantic poets you might have heard of include poets William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, with Lord Byron and his entourage representing the second generation of Romantics, who went on to influence novelists including Emily and Charlotte Bronte, and Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. A notorious philanderer who enjoyed relationships with both men and women, Lord Byron's considerable personal charm gave rise to the so-called Byronic hero, melancholy, dark and brooding, that many subsequent writers modelled their usually male protagonists on, creating flawed but fascinating characters, distinguished by self-absorption, emotional detachment and even cruelty to the women who loved them. With Gothic fiction, the distinction between protagonist and antagonist is often blurred. Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights, for example, is without doubt one of the principal characters of this bizarrely brilliant book, but he's also violent, vengeful, and sadistic. How then to explain why the aristocratic and beautiful Isabella Linton falls in love with Heathcliff and agrees to marry him? Why are readers still fascinated by this quite frankly cruel and horrible man? This brings us to one of the Gothic villain's most recognisable hallmarks, that even though they do bad things, there's something about them that readers have always found attractive, or at the very least, compelling. As I've already mentioned, Heathcliff is a classic example of a character whose cruel behaviour should render him reprehensible to those around him, particularly women, but instead inspires love and devotion, though it isn't long before the true depths of his perversity are exposed. Another feature of Gothic villains is their air of mystery. They may appear outwardly respectable, for example, they're of noble birth or aristocrats, such as Count Dracula, who says he is a boyar or nobleman, with some scholars claiming a historic link to Vlad the Destroyer. And although we now think of Count Dracula as the original vampire, initially his blood-sucking tendencies remained hidden from young Jonathan Harker. Heathcliff, of course, is a mystery from the start. Found roaming the streets of Liverpool by the kind-hearted Mr Earnshaw, Heathcliff's true age, origins and family background are unknown and remain shrouded in mystery throughout the novel. Slavingport, Ireland, where does he come from? Nor is the source of his newfound wealth clear when he returns to the Heights three years after leaving. There is some speculation that he made his money in Europe or in the American wars, but this is left deliberately obscure, which only adds to his air of mystery and deepens his intrigue as a gothic villain. Gothic villains may possess or appear to possess supernatural qualities and abilities. Heathcliff, for example, is referred to as a ghoul, even a devil, and the novel famously ends with a local claiming to have seen his and Cathy's ghosts roaming the moors. Heathcliff is also portrayed as possessing odd desires, such as his arguably incestuous love for Catherine, who is to all intents and purposes his sister. Towards the end of the novel, he lifts the lid of her coffin, possibly suggesting necrophilia, another unnatural or unusual quality. Even before the true extent of his extraordinary characteristics is unmasked, Count Dracula's appearance is striking. He's tall and thin, with flowing white moustaches, intense red eyes and tufts of hair on his hands and claw-like fingers. He appears to neither eat nor drink, and early on in Jonathan Harker's stay at Count Dracula, he discovers that his host makes no reflection in a mirror and flies into a frenzy at the sight of blood when Harker cuts himself shaving. Part of Dracula's effectiveness as a gothic character is, therefore, the slow build of fear and suspense that Harker, and therefore the reader, endures as gradually the grim details of who and what Dracula really is is revealed. It's worth remembering at this point that Stoker's original readers were encountering the story for the first time and would not necessarily have suspected 
that the Count was a centuries-old blood-sucking vampire. It is not until the involvement of Professor Van Helsing, a Dutch doctor and vampire expert, that the numerous other supernatural characteristics of the vampire are laid bare, such as his ability to shapeshift into nocturnal creatures such as bats and rats, telepathically connect with his victims, and even take the form of moonbeams and elemental dust. In addition, Gothic villains often inflict both emotional and physical violence on those around him. Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights is a good example. Wuthering Heights is a surprisingly violent novel which shocked its audience at the time, and even modern readers may be caught off guard by the sheer vindictiveness and cruelty of its characters, Heathcliff in particular. Heathcliff is of course a victim of violence himself. As a child, he is treated cruelly by Catherine and her brother Hindley, who treats him like a slave, bullying and abusing him for years. Heathcliff gets his own back when years later, he returns to the Heights and wrests control of the estate from Hindley, who has descended into alcoholism and debt. Heathcliff also subjects his wife Isabella Linton to extreme emotional abuse and later imprisons young Cathy before forcing her to marry his own son Linton, whom he treats with the same callousness he treated the boy's unfortunate mother. As a vampire, Count Dracula's brand of violence is both more explicit and extreme. His first victim is Lucy Westenra, a lovely young woman whose sad decline after being bitten by the Count is surely intended to stir up the reader's condemnation, even disgust. Within weeks, Lucy goes from a fresh-faced girl to a ghost of her former self who cannot find refuge even in death. Instead, she is forced to join the ranks of the undead, roaming the streets for the blood she needs to stay alive. Her prey even includes small children, whom Dracula is also known to prey upon. It's fair to say that Dr. Frankenstein's ill-fated creation has come to epitomise the gothic and horror genres around the world. And while the monster, as he's referred to in Mary Shelley's iconic novel, has come to symbolise the limitations of science and the wider folly of tinkering with nature, it's worth looking at how the creature is portrayed in the novel and to what extent he can be considered a gothic villain. The creature begins life on a wet and windy November night, the culmination of years of hard work by Dr. Frankenstein. As innocent as a newborn baby, he's unaware of his hideous appearance, craving love and attention. He cannot comprehend why his creator shuns him so completely. This motif of rejection recurs throughout the novel, eventually causing the creature to lash out, killing his creator's nearest and dearest, including a child. However, it's worth remembering that the creature didn't start out this way. He was driven to violence by the cruel treatment of those around him. Ultimately, Shelley forces us to question the role society plays in the shaping, or in this case, the misshaping of an individual. However deranged and different he might seem, Shelley suggests that the monster and his fate is ultimately a reflection of ourselves, an uncomfortable but perhaps necessary truth. Gothic villains often inhabit or frequent settings that most people would find frightening or intimidating, and if you'd like to learn more, then please click the link in the top right hand corner of your screen now to watch my video dedicated to Gothic settings. Camp Dracula's ancestral abode, Castle Dracula, is perched on a rocky precipice surrounded by thick forest in remote Transylvania. Within, the castle is riddled with winding corridors, locked rooms and secret basements that confound and confuse outsiders, and when away from home soil, Dracula is most comfortable in old and crumbling houses. Frankenstein's monster wanders the outskirts of society after his rejection by Dr. Frankenstein, and the novel features remote and dangerous landscapes such as Swiss Alps and the Arctic. Not to mention the graveyards Dr. Frankenstein frequents in search of body parts to create the monster. The moors in Wuthering Heights, windblown and remote, are another classic gothic backdrop, and it is here that Cathy and Heathcliff are happiest as children, free from the oppressive atmosphere of the house and Hindley's constant bullying. The moors' savage beauty aside, they possess an otherworldly mystique that makes them the ideal environment for the wild and unpredictable Heathcliff. I hope you enjoyed this video on gothic villains and found it useful, whether you're a teacher, student or someone who just loves literature. If you did, please subscribe to Litcrit now, give this video a thumbs up and leave me a comment down below. Thanks for your support and see you next time.